Excuse me. Thank you. We're good people, all of us in this room and in the province. We want the best for our families, for our kids and communities. And that was one of the reasons we signed Treaty 6. I know you must be all be tired, so I will not try to repeat what was said. But I haven't heard any other than this last presentation, which causes me some concern. Thank you for having me and Chief Leonard here. And I want to thank Marcel for personally visiting us and inviting us. Most of the people you see on the streets are Aboriginal, so he was right to invite us. It might be useful to ask us what is the impact a safe supply will have in our community. Is this a solution or create more problems? So today I want to express my concerns, but I also want to talk about solutions. In two. In 2021, it was 110, 160 overdoses, 2,000 deaths a year. That's too too many. In my research, the other the other the other thing that kept coming up was accidental overdose. And I thought, did they ask that person if it was an accident? What I do know is that this disease is progressive and chronic. It doesn't get better. Okay? Eventually, you take a drug, not to get high, but just to keep the horrors away. You know? Intertwined with moments of sanity is the overwhelming sense of hopelessness. Okay? During these bouts of DTs, and withdrawal, you have thoughts of suicide. It happened to me. When I sobered up, I weighed 142 pounds, completely malnourished. I see brothers and sisters on the streets on more de deadly drugs, where you, you see the body visibly eating itself. You know, you can see it. You can see it, to, you know, and the body eats itself to keep the vital organs alive. And you see it in their teeth, in their skin, in their weight, you know, their muscle, muscle tissue. You know. And how do we address that? In 2021, there was 6,000 6, um, visits per month to emergency room for misuse of opiates you know, amphetamines and alcocaine, you know, over 2,000 per month hospitalizations for these reasons. Every week there was um, 150 EMS, you know, emergency uh, events. Is this what, what we want? Is this an improvement from five years ago? Hmm? And what, what, what is going on there? The name safe supply reduces the perceived risk of trying this stuff. When the marijuana was legalized, you saw it go up. Are we moving towards that with these opiates? Safe supply replaces dependence from drug tra traffickers on the street to drug traffickers from government. Is that what we want? And distributing drugs does not create healing relationships for those that seek recovery and those that can provide that care. And one of the things to completely understand here and is that addicts, alcoholics, do not like where they're at. They, know, they do not like the misery that their addiction brings. They don't like going to jail losing their kids, losing their family, losing their jobs, you know, losing their health. But that's the nature of the illness. 
And if the help is not non-judgmental, they come in. They come in. Mm -hmm. Safe supply. Uh, we need to stop creating um, these. Um, excuse me. Maintaining Albertans' addictions without addressing the root causes of addictions. or empowering folks to lead healthier lives. Is this where housing them on the streets, not on, his, on, on the shelters? Hmm? I mean, keep them medicated. And it's happening throughout all the services that care for, supposed to care for people. You have group homes that have kids on Ritalin, Ritalin you know? You have people on on these homes that are on our drugs, mm -hmm. okay? The right, right place to sustain support, uh, support sustainable recovery from chronic uh, substance dependency is not on the streets. It's not distributing drugs at a safe consumption site where folks continue to injure their own bodies. These drugs don't provide health. Over time, they damage the body, the various organs in your body. We need solution, uh, solutions other than offering free, less dangerous drugs. Death due to drugs at the end of a very painful and personal journey, journeys. We appreciate that the government supply, you know, may reduce infections, crime, and hospitalization, which we hope can reduce barriers to accessing meaningful, you know, recovery programs. Right now, there is over 30,000 Aboriginal people who experience problematic substance use and want help, but can't get that help. They do not want to maintain their existence, whether those drugs are supplied by dealers or the government. Mm -hmm. Safe supplies does not address the fundamental addiction and mental health challenges that we're they're facing. It proposes to maintain the majority of tens of thousands of Alberta with chronic substance dependency in a state of ill health with all the associated personal, social, and financial costs. And we as a government, you know, uh, I shouldn't say we as a government, but we as a people of this province will bear that cost, and it keeps going up. What's the average age cost to keep some, to, to provide for street people? You might say it's nothing, but the cost is, in the studies that I've seen, is that it can be up to 100,000 and over. You know? That is outrageous, you know? So, um, how much time do I have? Three minutes left, sir. Okay. Do you have questions? So yes, we can we can open up for for Q and A now if you'd like. Sure. Uh, yeah, perfect. We got lots of time for Q and A. Uh, we'll start with MLA Yao. Chief, sir, thank you so much for the honor and the pleasure, uh, Chief Shirt, to be here to speak to us today. I'm wondering if you'd expand on your very first comments that you made, which was regarding our previous presenters. I wonder if you could expand on your thoughts there. Well, excuse me, I, I'm sorry, I have trouble hearing. Um, some of the first comments you made were regarding our previous presenters. I was wondering if you could expand on your thoughts on, on, on that. Probably the best way to explain that is that you know, give you a quick history. 
where are all these people coming from? You know, they're coming from, you know, in order to answer that, you need to look at the, um, at the conditions on the reserve, but also at our current treatment services. The average age of death in Saddle Lake is 50 for women, 46 for men. Okay? Most of the deaths are caused by preventable, treatable, chronic degenerative diseases, like alcoholism, diabetes, drug addiction, you know, um, cardiovascular diseases. Mm -hmm. And you look at that, what you see is a rapidly rising, tip of a rapidly rising chronic disease iceberg. What we see is problematic, very, very problematic, you know, and I'll describe that in a while. What we, what we don't see that's coming up is we should be highly concerned about, you know. Children in care, there's 52,000. 69% of them are native. That's 35,880. Those women and those men you know, that had those kids, did they choose that loss? Most of that was alcohol and drug related, chronic degenerative disease, preventable and treatable. <laughs> I've seen these kinds of talks about research, yeah? research. And that, that scares me because it justifies a, 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 not a solution, but something that's going to cause a long-term problem. Where are those mothers? Do you honestly believe those mothers chose that loss? But do you, when the parents have a preventable, should, preventable disease, shouldn't we help them? These kids are now showing up where? On the streets as they age out from social services. Hmm? In the um, inner city high school, in the prisons, in the women's prisons, in the streets, uh, the majority of kids now, the majority of the homeless people in St. Paul are now, have come from there. Hmm? We should be, that should be one of the things that we should be looking at, not on doing experiments on, on us. Hmm? I mean, Leonard and I came from the streets. Yeah. Leonard and I came from the streets. Back in 1973, I came back from the University of Health, uh, Santa Cruz, where I was working for about two and a half years. And within one month of arrival, Richard Anthony, head of ADAC, and, and Honorable Neil Crawford appro approved the funding proposal for Poundmaker's Lodge. And the success of that was really immediate. And when I look back, the success was in the training that we provided the staff. But not only that, was that our good cooks cooked everything from scratch. I can attribute my sobriety to living with a farm girl from Saskatchewan who cooked three meals a day from scratch. You know, That's the foundation. The foundation of all human functioning is the fuel for your heart to function. You know, every function in your body, physical, mental, emotional, uses fuel. Mm -hmm. So that was one month, and that was really quick. Mm -hmm. In the early 80s, the funding for the new facility in St. Albert was presented to Premier Lougheed in his cabinet, and within a month they approved it. That was good. Mm -hmm. We are also aware and happy that Premier Jason Kenney is adding more beds and encouraging innovation like San Patriano, which is based on a principle, principles of lifestyle recovery. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the 70s, a leader in the field of addiction said alcoholism hasn't been improved in any way improved in any way in the last 25 years. It's still true today. Most still operate on a Minnesota model with various, various um, with small variations. Okay? I want to spend uh, a few minutes talking about that. Can I have the first slide? That's, uh, I think, the third slide. Okay, the first slide. 
No, there's the next one, the one before that. The one before that. Okay, that one. You take a look at that, and what does it, what does it say? And it's something that almost like um, you don't want to look at or do research on. Studies that have reflected that about 40, 60% of individuals relapse within 30 days of leaving treatment. 85% relapse within a year. National Institute on Alcohol, Alcohol Abuse, uh, NIAAA, evidence shows 90% of people go back to using within four years. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the next slide, this is a study of uh, 26 treatment programs. 23% were stayed sober for one year, 7% stayed sober after four years. A lot of them had the, a lot of uh, lingering uh, psychological symptoms. Lifestyle-based and nutrition-based, 89% stayed sober for one year, 74% stayed sober after four years. Now, we go to that original slide with the pyramid. And why I want to look at this is to understand the disease process. The disease moves this way. It starts with how our body metabolizes alcohol and then moves upwards. And the damage it causes at the physical level has symptoms. Has symptoms. And all of those are psychological symptoms. Like our treatment approaches currently are not wrong. They're just incomplete. You know, we need to address those psychological symptoms. But what we ignore in most cases is the physical damage. And that physical damage is primarily nutritional based. If you look at the damage in there, neurotransmitter depletion, mental health, hypothyroidism, what they find is about 35% have it. But do you ever get tests? Is that a testing requirement at treatment centers? No. What are the symptoms of of hypothyroidism, depression, irritability, fatigue, lethargic, sudden anger, you know? Things that you need constant therapy for. You take a look at hypoglycemia, and you look at dry drunk, they're just like, like that, a mirror. You know? And yet we don't address those things. You know? People leave there with that kind of damage. And that's why they return back to drinking, because those symptoms, you can't talk yourself out of that damage, that physical damage. You know? So lifestyle program starts with that. But the thing about the lifestyle program that we're, we're, we're proposing is, is, is um, interesting. The next, the next, uh, next slide. No, no. No. Oh, God, God, I have them in the wrong order. It's a uh, backup. Okay, maybe it's not in there. Let me, let me talk about um, that. The Lifestyle Center that we're proposing mm -hmm. is the right place. You know, it's safe, it's free from any toxic influence, right people, highly trained, mm -hmm. the right time that it's wanted. And the thing about that is that most people want help. I was in Calgary at a meeting on 104th Street in, in uh, Tim Hortons. Sometimes a lot of meetings go on there. And, and I was in line, and this young girl, probably in the 20s, you know, came up to me and asked me, can you buy me a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. She was slightly unkempt, but, and I asked her, I said, um, what, what are you on? She looked at me and she says, yeah, I use opiates. So I didn't say anything. A little while later, she says, you know, I keep trying to go to a detox center, but I can't, you know, I can't seem to get in. You know? I don't know if that's rules, regulations, you know, filling out forms, being, you know. So what we know is that people do want help. They don't like the misery that this stuff, stuff brings, you know. The 
fourth thing in there is the right program. And in there was a cultural component. And a cultural component is all about re-understanding traditional food wisdom. Every culture has that. We had two. Chief Long Lodge in 1884 said, I want no government medicine. What I want is medicine that walks. Give my people good food and they will get better. My grandfather on my dad's side, his solution to everything was a sum. Feed him. You know? Because he understood that the body will do everything the creator wanted it to do if it has the good fuel. Mm -hmm. The other one, educational component about the disease, skill component, life skill, occupational, problem solving, interpersonal skill. Occupational, I really emphasize in that program. Why? Because we want people to look at getting a job as quickly as they can. Because the best relapse prevention program is a job. But a lot of these people that will be coming in there have no job history. So they, 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 um, they're going to have difficulties. But the thing they need to learn is that the philosophy of going for it, going for it, that a no is just one step closer to a yes. You know? And that kind of philosophy, you need to apply. You need to go out and get a job. And if you want, don't like that job, you want to do, look at educational opportunities and what you can get in there. Nutritional component. There again, if you consider the persons coming in there, when I sobered up, I had no cooking skills. Residential schools, I didn't learn any cooking skills or food preparation, you know? When I sobered up, all I knew was how to make what they call highway steak, was bologna and white bread. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not healthy. I was lucky I met that, uh, that girl, you know, saved my life. So in terms of nutritional component, it's a therapy, but, you know, and personalized therapy based on the assessment of that physical damage. And you can focus it. And we have a good team of nutritional doctors and lifestyle doctors that are working with us. Hmm? So the thing is that we can get that done. Recreational component, again, it's not about gym and all that stuff. This is all about just a yoga mat and, and looking at how you can keep your health healthy and what are the games that you need to relearn. Mm -hmm. But focus on that. We want some of these behaviors to be habitual. It's like let's say with the room, cleaning your room, so that when you come back in the evening, you feel good because it's nice and clean. If it's dirty, simple things, but really important things that we want to habituate. Okay? Non-medical detox, counseling component, aftercare apps. And this is an interesting one because there's so many ways to do the aftercare, especially if you have the apps. We'd like to work with a, a, a provider that, and say, can you give them two months free, free access? Yeah. Why? Because you can have your program in there and see where you're at. Are you in a red zone, white zone, you know, different zones? One, two, three, four. And what you need to do in those, uh, those, in those areas. You know? So it's right there. But they'll need that also to get their jobs and to access other services that will, you know, help them continue good health. The next slide. This one. Lifestyle diseases, they are triggered by the food environment that runs in a family. You think about that. A lot of times people say it's the genetics, you know? I think there's a genetic susceptibility, but it's the food environment. The kids are raised in that. The kids are raised in that. And that food environment also includes alcohol and, and, and drugs. And they're raised in that. And guess what? Boom. It just multiplies. You know, multiplies. More and more people are, are, are 
being affected. And lifestyle diseases require various cognitive, behavioral, and nutritional therapies to develop capacity for continuing self-care. One of, one, one of the things that we want to focus on here is that these are individuals. We want to give them the tools, the skills, the information, and, the, and help them recover their health because we know they can solve their own problems. Hmm? We have to give them the dignity of solving their own problems. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Emily Bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, for allowing me the opportunity uh, to ask a quick question. Um, our committee, uh, and, I'm, and, and it's going to be in the context of all of your knowledge, um, our committee has been uh, tasked uh, with regards to examining aspect, several aspects of safe supply uh, and that includes, I, I think, uh, your knowledge. Um, so what would be your views of safe supply or the provision of opioids with, to users uh, within the context of your approach to the treatment of addictions? I don't see no role in it, you know, in terms of my, 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 my view. Um, We'll keep them on the street longer, but they'll suffer longer, and the progressively the damage increases. Like we were showing at that physical damage and you know the biochemical damage that's happened. That's not doesn't go away. Talk therapy doesn't fix it. It requires that intervention. You fix that. The the abilities of people to deal with trauma, crisis increases. When you have um, trauma, let's say, your body uses what to deal with that trauma? Fuel. If that trauma is continuing and chronic, you bankrupt your system. And no amount of counseling will ever correct that. I mean, you look at the Holocaust in, the, in a way, and I think of the people there, you know, they became healthy because of their traditional food wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the focus on that. Yes? Uh, Emily, I'll have that question as well. I just wanted to make sure we got them in in time. So. Uh, again, Chief Chair, thank you so much for your uh, wisdom and knowledge. Um, throughout your presentation, I hear you mention things about nutrition. I heard you talk, I heard you talk about nutrition. I've heard you talk about housing. I've heard you talk about family supports. Uh, in your opinion, do you feel that these are things that are very proactive towards helping people uh, recover from addictions? Yeah. The basic premises is this, you know, you fix the body and, lot, and you give people the skills a lot of times they'll solve their own problems. It's like when we first started pound makers, people would come to our, our, uh, our center and they'd talk about their home situation. And the message that we gave them is that if you came from Skid Row, when you leave here, we don't want you to go back. And if your situation in your community is, is, is the same, we don't recommend you going back until you have managed to gain your health. In that sense, you need to look at solving your housing problem. Mm -hmm. You need to uh, solve these issues that will make your life better. And they will. You know, people will move on. People will become, you know, that's the nature of people. So I think it, 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 it's... it's In a lot of ways, there was... Um, old friend of mine used to say, you want to look at how we help people. You know, One is called cruel kindness. You take away that ability to solve their own problems. Tough love is also helping them be responsible, you know? Be responsible to move on their own issues. And that is so has a compounding effect because it goes down to other family members, to your kids, and you know? And so can we do that? We've 
propose to the government to start up a lifestyle center of excellence, a treatment program, you know? And we would like to do that because we know the results are so, so different. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that does conclude our time for today uh, that we, we had scheduled. So you got another closing point? Yeah. yeah. I want to thank you again for coming here. <laughs> Just teasing. <laughs> Safe supply. Again, I go down to the business. It costs $100,000 a year in terms of those individuals. Currently, the cost to de for detox beds is $300 a day. $150 a day for a treatment program. Lifestyle center, it's pretty much the same cost, but it's a, about $12,000 for a 90-day stay for, for individuals, and you come back super healthy, and the recovery rates will be higher. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that with safe supply, you're talking about adding, adding uh, the cost of that safe supply into that $100,000. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Whereas what we're talking about in terms of the kind of care we're proposing, and this is a solution, and it's coming from me, Chief Roger Martin, Chief uh, Leonard. Mm -hmm. We've come from the streets, and we've looked at everything in terms of over these last decades, you know? And we've seen the, the results. And there was just that vital component missing. Mm -hmm. so, so we can do it for $12,000 a person and, and keep them off the streets and keep them healthy and become functioning members in our community that contribute to the tax base and everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief, and uh, thank you for all the work that you've done in the addiction field over the years. So. We really appreciate you sharing your experience, uh, your, your wisdom with us, so thank you.